Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Tyler Peets, Executive Vice President of Global Data for Mighty Hive. And today we're going to be discussing how top food and beverage companies succeed at winning the digital shelf. Uh, so before we get into the questions, I'd like to start off with some introductions from our esteemed panelists. Uh, Gloria, why don't you go first? Hi, everyone. I'm Gloria DeCoes from Nestle USA. I'm the Director of Omnichannel Digital Marketing and the Digital Shelf. Wonderful. Thanks, Gloria. Uh, Ji? Hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Ji Chen. I'm the Global Head for E-Commerce and Direct-to-Consumer at uh, Mandalay International. We are the maker of Oreo cookies. If you see the beautiful virtual gigantic Oreos behind me, you know, so happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Ji. Uh, Michaela, why don't you go next? Hi, everyone. I'm Michaela Downs. I am the Director of Channel Commercialization for Digital for Coca-Cola Consolidated. And if you all don't know, Coca-Cola is a franchise system. So we're actually the largest bottler in North America. Wonderful. Uh, Stephen? Good morning. Um, glad to be here. My name is Stephen Coven. I am the Vice President of Omnichannel and E-Commerce at Crosswalk. Great. Um, well, thank you all for, for being here, and uh, it's great to have such an amazing group. Uh, just before we get into uh, some of the more detailed questions, um, we'd love to hear from each of you just for a couple minutes uh, to just lay the groundwork for our conversation uh, and maybe just expound a little bit on how your company views e-commerce, how that's evolved uh, over time and, and where you see it going in the near future. Uh, so let's go in the same order. Why don't you start, Gloria? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having this uh, at this time together. It's so opportune for us to, to really be thinking through this topic. Um, you know, if you would have asked us a, a, a year ago or maybe a little over a year ago, we knew that the e-commerce side was growing, um, especially for a legacy company like ours. Nestle USA is 150 years old. Right. And we've and we've learned how to be very, very successful through tried and proven ways that are primarily on the on the physical shelf. Um, but fast forward to a year and COVID has done so much to accelerate um, the importance of, of e-commerce. So within our organization, um, I would say that it, it was something that was important and growing and then just accelerated in terms of importance across um, across the organization. Great, thanks, Gloria. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think uh, a, a lot of companies um, were, uh, uh, if not caught flat-footed, certainly had a, a bit of a um, transformation very quickly as a result of COVID. So I'm sure that's something we'll uh, we'll touch on later in the panel. Um, G. Yeah, um, I think for Mandali, you know, we um, uh, the company uh, I actually joined uh, during the time of COVID in July last year. So I've been almost. Uh, uh, yeah, nine months in uh, now, and uh, 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 but I would say Mondali, and like any uh, most other companies, also certainly my prior company that I worked with as well, you know, Campbell Soup, you know, get serious in about e-com back in 2015 at the time, you know, but at the time during the years they've been building, laid the groundwork and building the flywheel, you know, uh, execution. Mm -hmm. So uh, fortunately when the COVID hit, we're actually in a position of strength, you know, so we're able to capitalize on the, uh, let's say the tailwind of e-com. So uh, I definitely ramped up uh, uh, investment uh, quite significantly you know, be, and continue to drive the capability. So for now, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, some wings we have globally, monthly, you know, for e-com, we, we have well, average about 6% of total business come from e-commerce. Apparently with markets like US, you know, penetration is much higher, close to 10% in China, certainly 17%. Then some wow. of the other markets were pretty just get started, right? Uh, and uh, so the penetration is much lower over there. But global average, I think we are, we are around about 6%, which is pretty substantial given the size of total business, you know. Um, and I, but I, this is certainly a very high in terms of priority in, in the company's uh, growth agenda as well. And as a matter of fact, our CEO at uh, uh, during our uh, quarterly earning calls talk about econ quite a bit as well. So I think the idea is how can we continue to drive uh, 
as consumers continue to or shops continue sh shifting uh, to online space, you know, let's make sure we are serving where they are, right? But in the meantime, also making sure, you know, we do have uh, pretty, I would say, um, purposeful as well, you know, in terms yeah. of how we approach uh, different retailers and also our D2C business, our EB2B business, you know, so that's the agenda. And uh, as consumer shift, we we'll certainly continue to build our capabilities. Yeah. Thanks, Xi. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's, it's remarkable to think that you have a, uh, a market like China that is 17% e-commerce and, you know, the U.S. Um, coming not far behind at 10%. And so I'm sure that the kind of disparity between different geographic markets plays a huge role, um, as does all of the different types of channels within the e-commerce umbrella that you mentioned. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Michaela, uh, so as a, the largest bottler for uh, CCNA, um, I, I imagine you have a pretty interesting take on this. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how um, Coca-Cola Consolidated views the space? Yeah, no, thanks. And actually, it's the NAOU now. They, they've they gone through a, a reorg, so you'll see that kind of changing your, your acronym. <laughs> yeah, I'm dating myself a little bit. It was CCNA <laughs> when, when, uh, when uh, they were my client, so yeah. Yes, yeah. So, so yeah, so I mean, as, as we've been talking about, Coca-Cola is a franchise system. So if you look at, I think there's, I mean, over 64 bottlers in North America itself. So um, there's different levels of engagement when it comes to e-commerce and Consolidated itself really started to lean in back in 2016. So they hired a dedicated resource, which was a bit abnormal at the time. You know, you had the, um, at the time, CCNA, you know, building out their e-commerce team when really it was just Amazon. Um, and then I came on in 2017 and, you know, you start seeing these resources being added from a bottler side to focus on these customers. So it's really great to kind of see and we, you know, consolidated if you, if you kind of know our reputation, we always kind of try to lead the way. So, um, so we started building out resources, building out teams. And then from there, I went from being on the trade team, pretty much calling on Amazon um, and started understanding that, you know, there's other customers coming, there's other, you know, there's other strategies out there. There's other e-commerce formats. So we just, you know, as a team just started to, you know, pinpoint all these different gaps and start addressing the gaps. We didn't really care about what team we sat on or what role that we had to do. We just kind of took the processes that our company had been doing for, you know, over a hundred years, I think almost 119 years at this point. And, you know, that's, it's different as consumers are shifting your supply chain has to shift. Like all of these things have to change and that's really hard to do. So kind of coming in with that fresh perspective and you know, really just asking the right questions, identifying processes, not trying to blow it up, but really get everyone to, to start shifting into that mindset. And um, similar to G, I came over into my current role mid COVID as well. So it was really exciting because at the time we had kind of had that, you know, account team mentality. And then we saw the shift in COVID and, you know, all this volume is shifting to different channels and our company, you know, really went on board. We're like, we need somebody to lead the strategy. This isn't something that's just from a sales perspective, like where are we going to go in the future? So um, my role got created mid COVID. I came over to, you know, lead strategy for those customers that are peer play in nature. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, but then also start integrating and, you know, a big component of the role is, is really training and education to get people to start thinking about it, to start talking about it. Um, words like omni channel and all of those words, I think they're kind of buzzwords in the industry, but not everyone's talking about it. So um, it's really great to kind of see the us as a bottle or rise up to the challenge. And I, I'm watching the mentality shift and it's, it's really, really great. Yeah, that's awesome. It's, it's so interesting. I think in a lot of cases, you know, we think about large brands like Coca-Cola as these kind of monolithic organizations, but sometimes we forget that there's lots of different pockets and that sometimes the change happens a little bit closer to the ground, closer to the customer, closer to the consumer. So yeah, thank you for right. sharing that. Um, Steven, so you recently came over to Crossmark from uh, Hormel. Uh, so, so we'd love to maybe have you spend a couple minutes just talking about uh, how that's changed your perspective um, maybe sitting client side and now advising uh, organizations yeah. on, on how to uh, accelerate their e-com strategy. So um, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So 
Uh, now about nine weeks into my role at Crossmark, which is a sales and marketing agency. And um, really for the last 20 years, I've been on the uh, manufacturer side, CPG, across different companies like Clorox, Hansel, and Hormel. And uh, obviously seeing that side of the business, but on this side, really it is allowing me to understand the issues, both on the manufacturer side and the retailer side. And what we're trying to do is play in the middle and try to bring you know, these parties together where there's this new complexity. You know, we've been, many of the panelists have talked about the shift that's occurring. Well, this, you know, it, it was a brick and mortar. Now you have this new activity of managing the digital shelf. Um, or we talk about direct to consumer. And so all of these are new capabilities, um, new requirements, and organizations are having to change. They're having to figure out, should we do it on site? Should we, should we partner? And how do we keep up with this? Um, you know, it is moving fast. Obviously, we just discussed it, it expanded tremendously with uh, March of last year with COVID, and it's not going back. Uh, you know, it's out of the can per se. So how do we manage with all of this complexity when right now a lot of retailers are doing it differently and we don't have full data? You know, what's the most efficient way to use that next dollar? Is it content? Is it advertising? How should I do D to C? So it's a great time. And so to answer your question, Tyler, it's great to leverage those insights from the manufacturer side and try to bring a better solution uh, from the agency side to help them. Yeah, fantastic. Um, it, so I think that that raises a, a, an interesting point. So everyone here is in food and beverage, um, although, you know, the specifics differ a little bit from company to company, uh, brand to brand. Uh, I do think that in general, there are some inherent challenges that food and beverage companies face in making e-com really work as a viable sales channel. So things like perishability. Um, relatively low unit cost, uh, impulse nature of some of these products. Um, so, so G, as someone who's spent time, uh, you know, had a long career in food and beverage, but has also spent some time uh, in e-commerce from uh, uh, the durable side, um, could you tell us a little bit about how um, uh, sort of the specific nature of food and beverage dictates your strategy? Um, challenges that you might have, opportunities that you might have, and, and how uh, Mondelez uh, views and, and, and handles this? Absolutely. Um, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it, it is, I actually started my e-commerce career like quite a while back in 2004 when I was appointed. This is a time I was counting a corporation, a hair dryer, quizzing out, you know, product, I was appointed to figure out how to sell hair dryer, uh, you know, online, basically, that's kind of pretty visionary. Now you think back, you know, in response, like, we launched a D2C site back in 2004, right, to, uh, to sell hair, county hair dryers. And, and this, we actually did it before we start to sell on Amazon, you know, so that, yeah. but the beauty of that it's durable. And that's why you can start that time. It's not, nobody was talking about selling, you know, grocery online at the time, I'm sure. And then in actually before I joined uh, uh, Mondelez, I was, I spent almost a year in Philips as well. So it's uh, on the consumer uh, electronics business as well as a personal health business, you know. So the Sonicare, the Norelco, those are the brands I uh, was responsible for mostly for, uh, for e-com as well. But the beauty is that both on the, Conair and Philips, you can see it's durable and uh, especially Philips Sonic is like over a hundred dollar box yeah. item, you know, so certainly much more e-com friendly. Yeah. Um, yeah, the challenge, they do have different challenges because the counterfeit toothbrush right. is actually, you need to, um, you know, manage that on Amazon, you know, so that's, a, then it comes to food and that's why I always try to explain to people, you need to look at food as a category, why it's different why it's so hard to get, uh, you know, that 30% in total penetration, like uh, you do see other uh, categories, right? Because it's perishable, you know, I think, uh, Gloria, you can probably talk more about that from the frozen side, but even just for snacks, you know, for us, for example, you know, uh, the, the summer shipment will be very challenging for our chocolate brands, right? Yeah. As a category in, in UK, you know, so it, how do you do summer shipping without Briggs Bank, basically? And the other piece is even, you know, with chips uh, or with, uh, uh, you know, or very thin biscuits, 
right? Mm -hmm. It's breakage is your concern, you know? Yeah. How can consumer, you know, we literally, I remember a uh, consumer will make comments, oh, it's delicious, but I have to eat with my spoon when I get it, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> so that is uh, the challenge you do see in the food and the beverage space, you know? So I think to address that, we, we learned a lot, I both from my Campbell's role and uh, counter role at uh, Mandalay, I think it's very important to have the right price pack architecture, you know, so yeah. the product designed for e-com fit for purpose, that's, a, that's really critical, you know, so this is not only to address the is a rice price point, right? You can't put mm. like two dollar item on uh, Oreo to 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 sell uh, to make profit, but you need to be creative to come up with the right pack type, whether a single serve or multi pack or variety pack. You know th that that is one. And the other thing is packaging, making sure it is sturdy when people get it. It is not uh, all <laughs> you know. Uh, it was you know broken cookies, you know. So. Those are the challenges and those are addressed. And, but I think the other piece I probably want to also mention about is the impulse buy. Uh, lots yeah. of our product, the Gamma Candy, you know, Trident is our, um, is the number one brand uh, in the gum category, right, for us. And, and uh, it is also oh. challenging to, uh, in, especially in, during the time of COVID, the total category took a huge hit. You know, how do you create the impulse buy online? That's another thing, you know, how do you creatively work and partner with your retail partners, you know? or even last milers. We did actually quite a lot of Tesla and pilot programs uh, last year with either Kroger in US or Rappi, the last mile delivery service company in Latam, right? To basically offer consumers at the right time, you know, almost before checkout, you know, remind them, do you need to add this to your cart? Or, you know, making uh, recommendations for com complimentary uh, you know, purchase. You know, so those are the tactics, activations you have been doing. I'll we'll continue to learn from that. So wow. it's, uh, yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's um, it's interesting that uh, you could kind of unwittingly end up sending someone uh, uh, effectively hot chocolate versus a, a Cadbury bar or Ritz dust versus Ritz crackers if, uh, if you don't have your packaging right. But yeah, I mean, I, I think you you raise a really interesting point, right? The um, the, there's so much uh, uh, kind of flexibility that actually presents a lot of, you know, really substantial challenges in terms of PPA, um, in terms of your supply chain, and, and then also just how you recreate those moments that happen physically in a, in a digital setting. It's, uh, it's really interesting. Thank you, Xi. Um, Gloria, so as Xi mentioned, um, you know, uh, Nestle has a, a lot of frozen foods and, you know, there's supply chain challenges there as well. Um, what, what's your take on this? Yeah. Oh, my, there's so much I want to address and what, what G, what you said, maybe we can talk later, but <laughs> these are always like therapy sessions, but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, what the, the, the physical shelves were not meant to be distribution centers. They were built for that, but they are today, right? When you think about it, a, a shopper is going and pulling something off of a Walmart shelf or a Kroger shelf. Right, and so in many ways, we have to create these products that um, that are that are simultaneously fulfilling both in-store demand and that online demand. And so I think what what's what's really interesting is that when we we have this opportunity to kind of build this new, new gold standard shelf, um, and to really think about that throughout our organization, right, um, both online and in-store. So Michaela, you mentioned earlier um, how you know the whole organization is starting to embrace this, and that's what we see at Nestle. Like from all the way through the the you know I'd go all the way back to what do we create? What's our assortment? We're competing in this space to be in just ten positions that are shopped eighty percent of the time through just a category um, search. Right. Um, and so they're, they're not always calling us out for for a brand name. They might just be calling us out like, you know, for us, we have a lot of frozen pizza. So they might not people might not type in like DiGiorno. They might type in a frozen pizza. They they will probably type in coffee creamer and not coffee mate. And so it's about how do you show up um, in a very competitive space? And so we really are thinking about it from our assortment of the products that we make to um, to how uh, we supply them 
um, to how we show up both in that physical and digital shelf. And that's why that's why Omni is so exciting because it's really not limited to e-commerce. You have to like really broaden that thinking to say, how do we win um, in both in both places? Yeah, that's that's fantastic, Gloria. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think that's a, a, a good segue into our, our next topic, which is um, the, the e-retail landscape at large. So obviously, um, there's lots of different types of companies and channels um, that have emerged uh, under the e-commerce umbrella. So you obviously have platforms like Amazon uh, that are uh, pure play in nature. You have now integrated retailers like Walmart and Target uh, here in the States um, that, that, you know, were traditionally bricks and mortar retailers and have, you know, built substantial e-commerce businesses. And then you have, you know, intermediaries, whether it's grocery companies like Instacart or food delivery services like Uber Eats or DoorDash, um, as well as many other types of companies that are emerging. So, um, Michaela, why don't you talk to us a little bit about how you view the landscape and, and kind of what your strategies are um, for, for each of these different types of channels and, and how they may differ from one of the next. Yeah, no, great. Um, and actually just kind of like following my career path at Consolidated, I've, I've touched all of it. So um, I've kind of been able to watch it transform over the, the past few years. And so I'll talk about now and then there's definitely some changes that will happen in the future just because of the nature of the business and the nature of the customers. So now the way we're really looking at it is we look at pure play kind of exclusive outside of, you know, any of the other omni-channel or intermediaries. So thinking kind of like your Amazon Fresh, your GoPuff, your DoorDash outside of the RDI piece. So we split those into two um, to really focus on what do we need to do to get our products into consumers' hands, uh, into their mouths, <laughs> drinking our products without have when they don't see it at all until they literally get it on their front door. So that's one. Two, then we start looking at the traditional kind of brick and mortars and how they've invested into e-commerce. So this is where that intermediary does kind of overlap with the omni-channel like integrated retailers because for one, we're training the trade team. So I'm working with our customer team, I'm working with our Kroger team, I'm working with our Walmart team, and we're understanding what does omni-channel mean? Because a lot of these customers have the word in their strategies. So we're kind of trying to reciprocate that. So when we're going in and selling in pallet displays, like how are we thinking about how that's going to be represented online or vice versa? If we want to invest online because they're asking for investment, how do we say, well, how do we support that volume, right? You know, you can't have an uptick in volume without more product, right? So um, I think uh, Gloria kind of alluded it to, to it earlier. It's just thinking from an operational lens too. It's not just, you know, search and in display and all of the, you know, fancy online stuff. It's how do we execute in store when the store doesn't get bigger? Um, so it really is posing a challenge. And so we're really focused against that. And then from a restaurant delivery intermediary or grocery del delivery intermediary, how do we make it easier for the customers participating on those platforms? I know there's a little bit less control, a little less branding for the retailers themselves so how do we equip them with you know not we kind of take our coke hat off and so you know granted we want to sell more coke sell more beverages but at the same time how do we think about like how do we help you get here um we're all kind of learning at the same time and you know there's some retailers that are you know behind others so really from a strategic standpoint how do we make this easier for you how do we identify pain points and, and grow together um, so really interesting, you know, landscape kind of differing conversations or different, different tools based on the customer you're talking to. Um, yeah. but I will also say that as, as we kind of continue down this path of e-commerce and digital and omni-channel and all the different words, customers will change again. Um, so you're already seeing Kroger kind of invest in Ocado, which is, you know, really that kind of Amazon model. So that's blurring that, that peer play to omni-channel line, you know. Who knows what's next for Amazon? I think there's, there's everything on the horizon of them. You know, they're really leading the way. So um, they've already opened brick and mortar with Amazon Go. What does that mean? Um, so we're seeing that channel blurring even, you know, post 
all of the channel blurring that happened from like a large store, small store perspective. But now you're seeing this like e-commerce channels blurring. So um, I'll say that the way we look at it today probably won't be the same in maybe even a year. Um, but we've been pretty good at, at adapting to that and just kind of pivoting to follow. Um, and eventually we want to lead, right? We want to be leaders in the space. But, you know, again, still trying to push the hundred year old uh, dinosaur in that direction. So hopefully we'll get there. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. So I think, you know, one theme that it seems to be emerging from, from all of these is that, you know, the world is only going to become more fragmented and complex and consumers' demands are only going to mm -hmm. increase, right? So it's really incumbent um, on, uh, uh, on the manufacturers and the marketers within those companies um, to, to create a new um, uh, muscle, right? To build a new muscle to be able to adapt quickly and, and address those, those needs. Um, G, uh, could, could you weigh in on this a little bit? So I know in addition to, um, you know, the, the, the U S market, which everyone here has some experience with, you're also, uh, uh, you know, trying to figure this out, uh, kind of simultaneously throughout lots of different global markets, uh, China, we mentioned before, which is really kind of the cradle of innovation in, in a lot of these areas. Um, what are you seeing and, and how is Mondelez adapting and, and shifting to um, just the uh, increased complexity in, um, in, in this space? Yeah, uh, great. Um, well, uh, Michaela, you certainly, you know, uh, everything you said, I 100% I agree. And it's certainly uh, very articulate and um, you know, said it very well. So I don't have a lot to add there, but what I can add is exactly China, you know, I think uh, it's, a, it's an interesting place. And a lot of time we do look at China in terms of what's the next innovation coming, uh, you know, for example, the live streaming and the social commerce. It's a real thing in China, you know, uh, and uh, it's, we do start to see that potentially with TikTok video, with Amazon live, you know, this will come to uh, in other markets as well. But like, just uh, if you don't, guys don't know Ping Duo Duo, which PDD, they call it, right? Uh, don't know that, uh, check them out. It's a miraculous uh, rise, uh, rise of Ping Duo Duo is just a brilliant mind away, you know, so it's a, uh, I think it's the, the beauty about that, and our team is also leaning in in those new platforms as well. The beauty is you know, do is Larry. It's a seamless uh, integration of social media and uh, the group buying, and that's why they can. They already their total. Uh, I believe the user monthly user is over close to eight hundred million in wow. five years. It's just. Um, like uh, sometimes it's harder to comprehend it just gives the, the population over there it's one thing you know but it is pretty important to stay uh you know stay on top of that and keep an eye on those innovation coming and uh, i can see that potential is another becomes another uh new retailers for us to uh to you know partner with and the similar retailers in us as well so I do think if I you can use one word, I've been reading a book uh, by Kevin, uh, Kevin Kelly, you know, about the 12 technologies, the ships of future, the inevitable. One thing I would use the word is becoming. It's like we're always constantly in this space of becoming something different. You know, yeah. it's uh, now is potential tomorrow. Yeah, you're, you're going to be something different. You know, yeah. so that uh, staying humble is really the key to uh, <laughs> to always, uh, you know, uh, to stay on. Yeah. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's, it's difficult because the, the world is kind of shifting beneath our feet constantly, but we don't know if it's a fad or if it's going to be the way that things are um, kind of carrying forward in a more persistent way. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, so just shifting gears a little bit. So contrasting with uh, uh, e-retailers, let's talk a little bit about um, direct to consumers. I know that this is a, um, a topic that, uh, you know, is, is particularly challenging in some instances for um, for FMCGs and in particular uh, for for food and beverage companies. Um, Stephen, you've you know now that you've stepped into a role where you have a um, maybe a little bit more of a bird's eye view across different companies um, in this space. Uh, tell us a little bit about um, what role D 2 C, uh, if any, is playing in, in different types of uh, uh, food and beverage manufacturers. Is it going to be a, vi a viable top line driver um, that can compete with uh, channel sales? Uh, is it mostly a vehicle for increasing loyalty, building direct consumer relationships? 
Um, is it something that uh, uh, is more focused on kind of uh, uh, more opportunistic things like gifting or uh, personalized products? Uh, share a little bit about what you're seeing in that area. Yeah, I, I would simply say all of the above. I think you <laughs> nailed a lot of the key aspects. Um, I think it is here to stay for sure. As you mentioned, it is a more difficult play. Uh, also, Gloria mentioned it with a refrigerated or frozen type product. The shipping costs are, are huge. Um, but I think that with the changes of the ability to obviously stand up a site pretty quickly, efficiently, um, the ability to, there's this whole new infrastructure that continues to become more in the sense of um, getting cold items or other items closer, having distribu distribution points closer to the consumer, that's going to help lower costs and also speed delivery. So I think the infrastructure, consumers are more likely to do it. Obviously, COVID brought DUC into you know, newer heights. So I think it's sort of all the above. And I think when a CPG is looking at it, uh, the things that I would start with is what is your goal? What is your strategy? And I think there's that opportunity for some growth, but it's not one that works for everyone. Yeah. So if it's not growth or even profitable growth, is it, is it learning about your consumer? So that those insights, uh, testing things. So learning about the consumer can be just how they interact with your site, which products do they like that are new? Are these new items that we should try to move? Full chain distribution, or, or sorry, let me rephrase it, a higher ACV in the sense of go to brick and mortar. Um, it also is a place to capture things that are changing in the space of this digital shelf. Uh, two of them would be ratings and reviews. So that's becoming a key part of the algorithm. And a, a way to do that is through direct to consumer. They're buying your product and you can ask for a review, and that might be a, a value add in your model. Um, the other aspect is where is first party and third party data going to land in the future? We have lots of regulations. We have changes in how Apple's doing things and Google Chrome. How is that all going to come together? And is third party data going to be available? So yeah. do we lean in as CPGs and start building more first party information? So those are the strategic things, you know, is this growth, is this insight, is this uh, helping with, you know, marketing uh, with first party data. But then you have to look through the lens of your portfolio. So if you're refrigerating frozen, you know, the infrastructure is not necessarily there and, you, you know, you're not going to pay a premium. Can you make personalization or customization that doesn't compete with your current channels? Yeah. Is that possible to do? For you to see with your supply chain. Um, and then do you have a product that bodes well to DC? One thing we have talked about is acquisition costs. Now you are the retailer, so you have to go get them per se into your door. And, and so are you able to do that effectively? And is that acquisition cost going to pay out over a repeat? Yeah. So those are the things that are happening. And then as we talked about uh, Steel PG, is that we're becoming different in a sense. You know, how is advertising going to change? How is infrastructure where the drop ship or the uh, closer one hour delivery and expectations on consumers, how is that all gonna to come together? So I would say it's a place to start, but it will never necessarily be bigger than going through traditional channels. Right. Yeah, uh, and, and so you mentioned an interesting point around, um, uh, you know, outside of this being purely kind of uh, seen as another channel, there are some strategic components to it, um, particularly in um, uh, collecting the ever elusive, especially for CPG's first party data, right? What, what you can actually garner from a direct relationship with the consumer, um, uh, which, which certainly um, you know, can come from D to C, can come from other types of relationships as well. Um, I, I guess just one quick follow-up question for you. Are you seeing an appetite um, in organizations to actually think of D2C as a strategic loss leader? Um, are there companies that are kind of stepping out of sort of the contribution uh, focus and, and saying, well, it may not contribute uh, to the bottom line, but ultimately it's going to pay dividends elsewhere. Are there companies that you see embracing that mentality? I've seen many. Um, 
And the, the, where it's getting approved at an executive level is not just as the PL aspect, it's the insights, it's the pre testing of innovation. Instead of playing paying slotting or national this of cost of just getting it out, maybe you having to buy a whole new plant to do it, you can do it in a more controlled, lower cost, lower risk situation. So those that are seeing the, the different aspect versus just pure growth and profit that are seeing the first party data, seeing the ratings review generation, uh, that holistic approach is really creating a better business case than those that are seeing that are leaning into it more. Great, um, uh, that's really interesting. Um, so uh, Gloria, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about um, a sort of building organizational buy-in and, 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 uh, and, and will. Uh, so when you look at sort of how your uh, organization has evolved, um, and really what it takes to put executives at ease with really pretty big shifts that require investment um, when the world is changing so quickly. Uh, how do you approach that? And, and how have you been able to successfully navigate a, uh, a company that has a, a long legacy of success in a totally different paradigm uh, to, to now navigating a, a, you know, a, a completely new one? Yeah. Oh, it's such a good question. You know, I think you cannot do this unless you've got both top down and bottom up um, kind of support. And we've been lucky in that sense. Our, our executive teams have been fantastic and saying, hey, we, you know, we've only gotten ahead in our in our world. Um, we're number one food seller in the world because we stay ahead of trends. Right. And so how do we think about that? Um, uh, in this world. And so if you don't have that executive level, it's so hard to push it from the from the bottom up, but we have that bottom up support. Uh -huh. I think that one of the biggest things uh, to do is to really think about the future. What does winning look like in the future? And then what do our career paths look like in the future, right? So even uh, you, you mentioned supply chain earlier, we say, well, 10 years from now, can you be successful in supply chain or finance or marketing without knowing this world? And the answer is probably not, right? So as we think about how is the company successful, and then how are our people successful? And then, then from there, how do we build the knowledge that, that needs to either um, transfer, or really it's about building like the, the confidence, right? And, and the confidence um, in this new space. Because I think that what we find is people are so eager to learn. They, they want to know, they just may not know what to ask or what, you know, how, how do we do it? I don't know. And so you know, I think that it's so important for us to just think about that. What does that future winning look like? both as people and a company. Um, and then from there, um, it, then we can build up the education, um, Michaela, that you, you mentioned earlier, which I'm sure all of us do a lot of. Yeah. Great, great. Yeah. And, um, and, and G, maybe you could weigh in a little bit. Are there any specific things that have, have presented um, uh, particular challenges for you, uh, changes that, that you've uh, worked hard to, to shift within the organization, um, whether more tactical stuff or, or kind of broader ways of working changes. Um, is there anything that comes to mind for you as far as um, how to, uh, like particular challenges that you've had and, and how you've navigated them? I think uh, for a company like ours, you know, I, I do think everybody kind of recognize the importance, the strategic importance of e -com, right? And also uh, in the world of D2C as well, you know, it's mission critical for us actually. Um, so the, the, the recognition is there and the leadership support is also there. You know, the dollar will come, but I think the biggest challenge potentially is because you set up a tradition as a company is to service truckload <laughs> uh, shipment, <laughs> you know, but you know, how to, wire, rewire your supply chain, how to, you know, uh, create a, uh, you know, the commercialization process, which is really respond swiftly to the e-com needs, you know, because commercializing in traditional CBG company takes, you know, if it's not uh, uh, nine months, probably uh, at least six months long, which in e -com, which is actually fast on yeah. average, but on e -com space, you really need to have a couple of weeks, right? So how do we re respond to that? You know, so that is probably the challenge. It's a process, you know, I think we're making, there's some step change we're making and we're, we're getting, uh, every day we're making progress, I would say, but we're definitely not there yet. That's those kind of the biggest challenge. And also to Gloria and uh, Michaela and uh, Stephen, you all mentioned, 
education, certainly. You know, I think one of the role we all play in the econ space, you know, we need to be the educator for the organization, rescaling, upscaling the knowledge about econ, you know, the nuances of that, get everybody on board, you know. So that is a, is a really important uh, a mission, as well, I call it a mission, you know, it is. Uh, uh, so, so uh, yeah, those are the two things I can add to it. Yeah, thank you. I'm sure sometimes it feels like mission impossible, but um, uh, your organizations are all very lucky to have you to, um, to, to nudge them in the right direction. Uh, Stephen, why don't you why don't you round us out here and just um, again maybe kind of thinking about um, you know spending time uh, within an organization and, and trying to affect change that way and, and your new perch. Um, uh, any uh, any specific lessons or, or best practices for um, uh, you know colleagues or uh, uh, folks that are within these organizations that are trying to um, to make that nudge happen? Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, still I get from Gloria, I think is that you have to start at the top and the bottom. Um, and you know the top is very important. Some of them are not as close to what's happening as it comes to the shifts or the complexity of what it takes to do it if it's the marketing side, if it's the sales side, or the supply side. So I think it's really important to start at the very fundamentals of why this is different to build up their understanding. Then you can layer on things like ask for resources or changes in, you know, go to market. But if they don't have these fundamentals, then it's really hard for them to understand the why of the ask. So for instance is, you know, historically we've worked with people to sell things in at a, a retailer. Well, now that is very much determined by the success of an algorithm. And so you need different skills. You need to upskill or hire new people to do that. So I think if you start with those fundamentals and then say the why I need this, that's going to be you know your best uh, if, you know opportunity. The, the problem is is we're all very um, you know trying to repeat from last year you know and uh, a couple of things because of that is change is not hard is hard and um, you know budgets are tight so you have to be where I'm heading with this is pragmatic you know yeah education is free. Start with that, you know, partnering, you know, upskilling people, educating, all those things to help move this very dramatic change that is necessary in every organization to work in this new field. Great. Well, um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for, but I think that's a, a great place to end. Uh, Gloria, G, Michaela, Stephen, thank you so much for your time and for uh, sharing your secret sauce today. Uh, wonderful conversation and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Yeah, Thank bye. You. Thank you. Thank you.